Oh yeah, a black sun in the hizzle. Oh, the shizzledism. We got an excellent show here today. Uh oh, look like I'm gonna need the big lens. Damn, am I gonna need the big lens today? Well, no, because this is gonna be. Um, we got an excellent show here today. We're gonna have Nature Mom come on and um, talk about. A hey, twin is my first things first. Twin Deacon, how's my mic? Is my mic good? Check, check. What testing? One, two, three. Testing, man. But we do the mic checks when I do the Bluetooth. Black Sun, don't trust the Bluetooth. I don't trust this type of technology. But you're on the road doing the show. So need some assistance. I wish this car would fucking go. Just go. Come on, just go. Go. God damn. All right, got fire and a thumbs up. And we got people speeding. No, nah, bro. Now, nah, bro. No. Nah. We ain't doing that. All right, so we waiting on nature, mom. So while we waiting on nature, mom, I want to speak on the last show we did. Um, shout out to MD20. Shout out to Trevor, man. We're going to be moving that show to Tuesday. So, um, oh, good, good, good. We're going to be moving champion, uh, champion circle to Tuesday. I just wanted to try it out. Uh, we will be having um, Michelle Rollins back on for Fitness Fridays. Um, so I'm going to contact her. But tonight, today we got Nature Mom. We got Nature Mom today. And we're going to be dealing with the uh, Tulsa, different black, uh, prominent black, black cities, because this is very relevant to the topic that me and Yang, or yesterday's topic, me and Yanga were kind of having some disagreement about capitalism. Um, I've already done Angel, Angel Snuff Snuff 7 already played my, uh, shout out to Angel, shout out to Mississippi Campaign. He already played the excerpt. I, I mean, I said it on my channel. Um, he remixed it and brought up the sound. Appreciate that, Angel, and brought it out because I was having some technical. Di I didn't have the thing right in front of my mouth, so the volume was low. But I think, and I was talking about some vegan stuff too. That's what I was like, damn. But anywho, um, we're going to talk about the black cities that thrive during reconstruction we're going to talk about black capitalism and i don't care yanga said that the majority of people would be against it blah 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 socialism brother the black capitalists would be the workers okay or the ones building the city are the workers and the ones you talk about being socialist that we got to help these other people be communal are the ones are they working are they working? Because even Adon last night had to, well, he, I don't want to say he agreed. He just showed in the scriptures where I'm saying the same thing. Okay, Adon, we, we get it. You make good points. Where me and you draw the line is I'm not down with no theocracy. That's it. Mississippi campaign is not down with no theocracy. That's it. So, you know, you can say, hey, Say all the oh, the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat either. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. But the Bible also says that they want to establish a theocracy. And as far as American black working class, that is a no go. That is a no go. Just for the mere fact that you don't want to work on the Sabbath, no, we want to work on the Sabbath. We want to make our money. I run my business anytime I feel like working my business. I'm not going to have any Yahweh or Sky Daddy telling me in the contrary. So that's that. That is that, you know, so I'm not I'm not down with no Tifa theocratic government. But, you know, you'll have your day again. You'll have your day again. You know, once uh, we get Yanga established with his. Ooh. OK, y'all look like I'm at the. Uh, Hold on one second, y'all. I'm at the, uh, damn, let me cut this thing off. I had to cut my fans off so I can talk on the CV. This is CO6, CO6. Damn, I hope they, this is why I don't like, 
you know what? Let me uh let me not dang spread my damn work business on the internet like that because people will use it against you. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> not not my crowd, but you know, people, other people. Anywho, um hmm. Oh, appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah, waiting on Nature Mom to get here. I just did not put the um Yeah, I put the link in the description and somehow she didn't get it. Oh Jesus Christ. Oh God. Hold on, y'all. Go to YouTube. Go to YouTube. Damn. Go to YouTube. My God, man. Oh Jesus fucking Christ. No, this can't be happening. That's why I got subscribers and views and all that because people who don't know how to get here. Like people who I'm telling to come to the show, they don't know how to get. Mm. Nature Mom's running a little late. <laughs> oh my gosh. Damn, we talk about. Oh gosh. Already here. Okay, look in the chat. Mm mm mm. Damn. Um, hold on, y'all. Hold on. I don't know. Jesus Christ. Mm-mm-mm. Hold on one second, y'all. Hold on one second. Shit. Okay, y'all. I, I don't. I don't know what's going on. Um, no, I know what's going on. Ah, just sent the link, man. Hopefully, I don't know. Damn, this damn thing. I guess can be complicated if people are not used to it. Mm. Technical difficulties. Um. <laughs> Twain, you can say that. You can say that, man. Um, I don't know. Uh, do y'all see the link in the chat? Y'all, let me know if you see the link in the chat, because I'm I'm not understanding. Mm. Something's missing. I'll do it again. Copy. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Ah, just some of the kinks, man. Some of the kinks. Paste. Chat. Okay. So we got the... Okay, so we got... Okay. Sent it again. Uh, there we go. All right. There we go. There. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. The, the, the setup here. Okay. Hi. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I can hear you just fine. Okay. Okay. Great. So, how are you right. today? I'm doing good, uh, Nature Mom. Um, I keep coming across people who, especially black people, talk about you know <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> it's evil. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, hmm, that's funny because I know Nature Mom has studied some of the black cities after reconstruction and did quite well in this evil capitalistic uh, system. Right. So I wanted you to kind of break down. Um, okay. So let, mean, let's yeah. first deal with, uh, I see twin. Hi twin. It, he has, um, he's showing um, technical difficulties. Are we okay now? Hi, no, Deacon. Good. Yeah, we're good. We good. Uh, it's good, good to see you guys or be here with you guys. Thank you for having me again. I always enjoy uh, sharing, you know, the knowledge and everything that I've learned. Uh, so yeah, getting right into it here, capitalism. <clears throat> you know, capitalism is um, 
a very interesting construct. I mean, basically, we're just talking about, um, you know, the the bourgeoisie versus the the, the laborer, right? I mean, that's what tr the true essence of capitalism is supposed to be about. If we are following the idea of Karl Marx, um, but. Okay. When we're talking about uh, the system that we're living in today, the capitalistic system, um, yeah, reconstruction, <laughs> I would even like to step back uh, from reconstruction and just kind of look at what was going on in the Americas uh, when the uh, great, great twin, okay, um, I what was going on uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation? Where were Black people? You know, they were brought um, to this emancipation, you know, through the, that civil war with a lot of promises. You know, these, these promises that they were going to have equal ground here in America. They were going to be able to equally, um, you know, uh, thrive and be able to create um, a... a, a a living, you know, that uh, was the complete opposite of what they've experienced before their, that time where they were just completely dehumanized. What ended up happening was, you know, these, these soldiers, uh, the, these black, uh, you know, um, ex-slaves, you know, they were brought into this fight. Uh, the, the fight was in, in many ways in their name. And, um, and what ended up happening was they fought. They felt like they fought for their freedom and for their equality on, on American soil. Right. And what ended up happening in the end was, um, you know, when the dust settled, um, the South was was given the best deal out of, out of the whole, uh, when, we, when I say the South, I'm talking about the Confederacy. They were given yes. the best deal out of the um out of the the civil why, war why do you say they got the best deal um because well first of all uh a lot of the promises that were made to these um black soldiers who enlisted you know they were they they were promised you know um the wealth that they had been working for 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 hundreds of years they were promised land they were okay. promised um things that um never never came to fruition and okay. what ended up happening was um through um this this uh, reconstruction the confederacy ended up um getting uh their land back <laughs> they they got uh a lot of federal protections and their federal protections even um, protected them against uh, the people that they uh, had so cruelly um, exploited and, and uh, dehumanized. Yet, on the other hand, uh, the, these uh, Black citizens, they weren't given any federal protections. I mean, they were given, you know, the, what, the, the 13th and the 14th Amendment. And then... Um, and then they were brutalized. They were, um, they were, you know, invited to go back to the South as slave laborers again. <laughs> or the second choice was to try to unite with the, the um, you know, people of the North who absolutely did not want them to stay uh, in their areas. So what were they left with? They were left with a promise, um, completely defaulted deals, and, um, you know, these lost, crumbling, you know, communities of people who did not have resources to food, did not have resources to housing. And so you're saying um, they started, they started from zero. They started from absolutely zero. So would you say they were in a worse position back then because of reconstruction and the war and starting off with nothing as a compared to us living now? Um, a, a comparison of then to now? Yeah. I mean, no, I think that we are still, it's not really like, um, like we can really compare the way that we are 
um, today to the way that things were then, we're still in, let's say, a ricochet of that of that era. We're still living in that ricochet. The thing that's very interesting about um, that ricochet is that you know, we, we knew we were standing on, on zero ground at that point. So, you know, people just started to find places to live. They started building communities. They started working together because they knew they couldn't go to the South and they knew they didn't really have the hand of the North, uh, Northerners to support them. So what they did was they supported themselves. They started to figure out a way to, um, to with nothing, to, to commerce between each other, to build between each other, they started to um, construct their own education systems. They started to construct their own markets, their own entertainment places. So, I mean, you know, when you look at where they were then, they were in a, a position of force building. And um, they were also in a mindset of eagerness to build because they have never been given that opportunity on American soil before that point. Right. So, um, so this, when you have the, this, like um, this enthusiasm to build and you're given this, you know, very blank slate, no one really cared. <laughs> that was the thing. The, the, I mean, to be honest with you, I think that a lot of uh, the uh, white people of the time felt like, well, if they die, they die. If, you know, we don't really care what happens, you know, as long as they're not competing for our, you know, resources and our, they're not in our communities, we don't really care what happens to them. And what was the most unexpected was that, um, Black people built communities that thrived. Right. Um, so moving forward a little bit um, more. Okay. So yeah, like you said, the reconstruction took place and these communities outside of expectations started to grow. Um, and what was interesting was we had um, this economic downturn uh, known, uh, as the, as the great depression. And right. this is a time where you start to see just like in many different eras of history, whenever you, um, start to look at the, like the spikes in lynchings in, um, um, white brutality towards black communities, there was always this correlation with, um, economics. So, you know, right. when, um, when, uh, these black communities were doing well, I mean, the worst of the, you know, um, the tyranny and the worst of the, um, you know, brutalities started to take place when the rest of America, started to lose um, their financial foothold, what they felt like was their stronghold. And, you know, there's even places I, I was um, re-watching um, a, a, one of my favorite documentaries about Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And there's this one particular part that always jumps out at me when I'm watching this documentary. And it's how um, the narrator describes how you could climb this hill um, in, in Greenwood. And at the top of this hill, you could see on one side, you know, the Greenwood community and it's bustling and it has these great school structures. It has these like, you know, streets full of people moving and thriving and living in a reality that was complete opposite of their white neighbors on the other side of the hill. On the other side of the hill, you know, you could see this um, this destitution beginning. You could see a lot of, um, you know, uh, white workers being put out of work. You know, so these men are sitting on the streets and and they're, you know, becoming angry together and, and losing their hope right. and unable to, you know, provide food for their families. And just over the hill, you have this, like, this you know, nearly forgotten black community 
that was bustling and that had their own complete economic system. So when you wow. use the word capitalism, what's interesting to me about capitalism and, and I'm spending more and more time um, digging into is that it, it really appeared at that time that there were two different systems of capitalism happening, particularly in America. Right. So you had the overall capitalist system you know, that uh, we were all under the umbrella of, but but these uh, ex-Black slaves were not even expected to survive. Um, and they ended up uh, creating their own micro-capitalistic system. Right. And their money black was... It, it was Black capitalism. Right. So, okay. you know, it, it, it was completely um, not affected in the same way as the white capitalistic system that was, I mean, people were throwing themselves out of buildings on Wall Street. Right. You know, there was um, mass suicides happening. And, you know, you turn to your black neighbor who you expected to already be destitute years ago and you turn and you see them and they're wearing fine clothing <laughs> they're driving nice cars they are spending their money and they're keeping their money within their own communities and even people who worked outside you know in the rare occasions when they worked outside of the black community of of, of you know these um black communities that were happening all over the united states Right. They were bringing their earnings back to these communities, and that's where their earnings from outside the community were starting to circulate. So they were actually pulling um, finance, e economics out of the overall capitalist system and bringing it into these little micro, um, you know, circuits of uh, economic boom. Okay, so happening. now you, you say they started all from nothing. Now. I know the slaves carried on with them agriculture. You know, a lot of them carried seeds from Africa, like you said, when we talked about the hair, how they hid seeds in their hair and all that stuff. Yeah, so, uh, old practices, yes. Right. Uh, I think that the thing that um, started to happen, I mean, you know, people were, um, uh, you know, they were starting their own industries. Let's say, for example, um, uh there there were you know young boys uh who were um you know running newspapers these are like little <laughs> 9 10 15 year old kids who had their own money enough money to buy their own little plots of land and they were doing this these little kids they were they were shoe shining they were running paper routes they were doing errands within the community and they were bringing because every member of the family was working and and it, it was a sense of pride and joy um so you know to be um a, a gainfully employed young man at the time or young woman it was um something it was an honor that you brought to your whole family because everybody knew where you came from and right. that you like we just said you came from nothing and yet your your nine-year-old kid made enough money to buy property when their white you know uh you know neighbor uh, on, now, on the other side of the hill couldn't even, Jamal, like, these keep are, their family right so you're talking about several different cities and several different states Yes, yes. This this was happening okay. all over. I mean, I I haven't. I've been studying this now for a little bit over a year and a half, right. and I still can't get all of the um, communities that were all over the United States. Can um, we do with just a, five? Can we do with just five in all different oh, states? Sure. Oh, okay. okay. So, so now, I mean, I can, we can always come back to this. I mean, right. I see where you're going in your studies. So I'm just saying. Just for time's sake, maybe just give us five cities in in five distinct different areas, and okay, if we can just just pinpoint. I mean, um, yeah, I can. I process, can give you a list, right? I, I, because, absolutely. Because I'm trying to figure out how capitalism. Now, I'm not talking about crony capitalism. How these black people that practice capitalism, how it was so evil and destructive, you know, because. Right. I, I've done my study on socialism 
and it's it has destroyed cities it has destroyed nations so mm -hmm. i just want to kind of compare the two um uh, well i think that uh, uh like you i i'm i've I've invested my time and my money <laughs> and energy into courses to understand these things um, as well, particularly socialism, capitalism, uh, on a, let's say on a university scale. I'll be honest with you. I, I feel like um, the system that we are still learning from um, in the United States is such a biased system that we we can't really get uh, the full scope um, because uh, it's it's still a system of education that is con controlled by the same government who worked on many levels uh, against us to this day. And um, what I mean by that is whether we look in, you know, socialism, capitalism, any science, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, science was tainted you know, at these times for particular gains and, and for, um, well, that's why I wanted to use the specific cities. Yeah. Okay. So like, yeah, we, there. I mean, the, the, the facts are there. I mean, the facts I've seen from studying socialism and the facts I've seen studying capitalism. I mean, the, the, the facts are there where we want to talk about evil racist governments or not. I'm talking about economical system that has destroyed cities and nations and i'm talking about one where you could point out in our past where you know black people that's why i labeled the show black capitalism where it actually um thrived so i well, wanted to I, get to the meat absolutely. potatoes of, okay yeah i mean so yeah i can give you a, a list i mean you know we were we can start uh, from the very beginning you know uh the the you know the Elaine massacre of Shout Arkansas. Shout out to Angel. Shout out to Angel. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so what? absolutely. Um, so th this is th this is the heart of uh, the sharecropping stories. You know. So this is where, okay. you know, the ex slaves were invited to come back to um, the plantation. So share cropping. We're, we're talking about we're talking about agri agriculture. Sure. Ag Go back ahead. to agriculture exactly you know so this is where the the okay, okay. white plantation owners you know they were given back through this deal they were given back the land and this was the same land that uh, the ex-slaves were supposed to be um you know uh, given as a let's say a reformation for all of the you know slavery brutality etc but it was given back to the plantation owners and so what was happening was the plantation owners they own this land but they absolutely had no idea what to do with this land themselves you know so yeah they they knew that it was a great right. idea a, right. a good interest for them to partner with these you know these inferior people because this is still how they saw them you know they they really saw us at that time that you know um we were like children and we, we needed to be shepherded and we needed you know their right. control of our lives were, was for our better good and um right. and so you know let me calm myself down and let me invite you back to the plantation and we'll work as partners but what they did was they okay. they finagled the books they finagled the deal you know, uh, so instead of these share crop, um, th this shared cropping working out, um, they ended up um, basically co confusing and and making these deals to where, yeah, you're on my land, but you need to pay for, you know, your 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 time on my land. You need to pay for the seeds that you're planting. You need to pay for any of the tools that you're borrowing for, you know, working the land. Um, you need to pay for the gas and the, the equipment for, for, you know, hauling. You got to pay, you know, the feed for the horses. So at the end, um, these, you know, landowners were going off and they were sh they were selling you know this cotton and all these different agriculture making a killing and then coming back and telling you know these these sharecroppers uh yeah you you would have made some money i didn't make much and you would have made something of not much of what i made but you owe me all this debt so that essentially put a lot of black people back into slavery and so what happened 
um, should we say unspoken slavery. And what ended up happening was um, these black people, they, they unionized, they got smart. They, um, they, they actually got a lawyer and filed a, a class action suit against these uh, landowners. Uh, go ahead. I saw. Right. Yeah. Uh, so no, when I'll they, just, um, I wanted to ask everybody. No. Oh. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Sorry. I think there's a slight delay because oh, I'm in a new space. Yeah. And let me know if you guys have me in good time because sometimes, uh, you know, the internet is kind of iffy where I am. Okay. I see twin. Okay. Can you hear me? Black sun. Uh oh. Black Sun. Oh, Thank no. you, Bobby. There. Uh oh. I think. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. Mm -mm. Uh oh. You guys, let me know if you can uh -oh. hear me at all. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Nisa. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Nisa. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, can you hear there me? I don't go. know. One of our connections is is yeah. Okay. It, it could be the connection here. Uh. So. I hope uh -oh. that uh, I hope that you guys can hear me okay. Oh, okay, great. Hi, Angel. Okay, so so I'm I'm getting thumbs up from Angel that uh, okay. you guys can hear me. Okay, so like okay. yeah, like I was saying. So yeah, you hear. So when these um, these black people unionize and and they uh, decided to become intelligent and legal about it it created a mob backlash. It created um, a one of the most horrific massacres ever recorded on American in American history. And the thing about this massacre is that information about it is starting like many other communities to, to leak out now. But these um, massacres were actually locked and closed behind uh, doors and investigators and journalists, you know, amateur journalists, professional journalists had to fight to get these locked doors open to uncover um, the, the information about these massacres. And I tell you why, you guys. Um, the, the worst part about it is that uh, the local and the federal governments are implicated as a part of this massacre. So when you look at it this way, um, yeah, th this is one of the biggest atrocities, um, and our 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 federal all the way up to our federal government is still liable for uh, the lives of people and uh, the loss of lives, the loss of property, the loss of vitality and the loss of opportunity for people to stand up against themselves. So this is a time in American history where it became very, very blatant that as these you know, communities of people were creating their own capitalistic system, their micro -capital capitalism, um, and they were trying to stand up for that capitalism um, in, in, in righteous and legal ways, uh, they were being completely severed from um, the federal governments. They were completely being cut off from any type of protection. And the federal government itself became a part of the team of people who, um, you know, who, who took place part in that massacre and it's even hard to say because wow that that's how real this history is um right. but that is the reality of of what's happened so i'm gonna be honest with you guys you know when i i'm reading you know this new bill and if i uh, if i can just uh kind of share this you know these uh new white house plans uh written um put on the fact sheets of, of uh, you know, advancing equality opportunities for Black Americans in their communities. 
I, I think that uh, the first place that if, if this was a genuine effort to, um, to advance equality and to repair any of the damages that have happened, we have to go back to uh, Elaine, uh, Arkansas. Uh, I'm going to start uh, city dropping here. We have to go back to um, Florida, Okincha, Florida. We have to go back to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to Greenwood. You know, we have to go back to Rosewood. We have to go back to, uh, you know, Charlotte, Brooklyn, North Carolina. Um, we have to look at all uh, of these cities like, um, you know, the Wilmington massacre. I mean, there's just so many cities, <laughs> but there's at least five right there, you know, um, that were some of the biggest atrocities that have been recorded. Um, I think that the biggest issue is that there's still, um, there's still data that is missing and has, has been intentionally destroyed. And, um, you know, these documents, this important information about these communities is hard evidence. And right. we need this hard evidence uncovered. Um, I think that like when we're th those cities right there that I mentioned, you know, um, uh, uh, Elaine, Arkansas, Okincha, Florida, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rosewood, um, Wilmington. I, we still there there has been like scientists who've gone in and they have like brought soil samples they have proven already that um that there are anomalies taking place in the soil because the issue is we can't really get to the heart of what happened to these thriving communities without uh some forensic proof and mm -hmm. There has been soil samples brought in that, that shows that they might be able to uncover some mass graves. And, um, and none of that has been uh, even gone back to or uh, none of that land to this date has been excavated. And what's important mm -hmm. about getting that done is that when they excavate that land, they are going to find remnants they're gonna find bones they're gonna find descendants today just like angel said you know he said that you know his family um it, he comes from descendants of, of sharecroppers and you know they they were left with nothing to to give to their communities yet i guarantee you those people had a very big hand in um, the thriving communities that were taking place all across America at that time. I, I think that a lot of people here don't, don't even know about Seneca Village. You know, if anybody out there knows about Seneca Village, uh, Seneca Village today is also known as Central Park. And uh, Central Park was, an, was a thriving Black community. Um, so... Um, Okay, so Deacon is sharing that uh, they have uncovered some mass graves in Texas recently. So I'm very, I'm very, very, uh, Deacon, I would love some information about that because, um, yeah, there are little pieces here and there uh, I'm hearing about, um, but I have not seen any hard uh, proof yet. So I would love uh, any information that you can forward to us about that because... I would like to uh, dig into that myself, but absolutely. They're just, I mean, it, when I was looking at a map of the United States and all of these uh, little dots put in all of the thriving communities that were all across America, particularly um, from uh, about, let's say, 1880, all the way until the um, 19, uh, we're looking up to 1930s. Um, there were so many thriving communities. And today, it, I mean, I don't know if we can even, uh, oh, thank you, Deacon. Uh, I don't know if we could even see if one of those hundreds of communities are still thriving. You know, and we're not talking about a little bit of, you know, capitalistic boom. 
we're talking about as the rest of the country was in complete destitution, these communities were absolutely thriving. And, and there, it was a big part of why a lot of these massacres took place. You know, there were a lot of people who felt, especially, you know, um, Confederates, um, you know, um, uh, poor white communities because they were, you know, they were using, um, especially media, the monopoly of media at the time to really, um, you know, put this narrative out there. And, and I want to talk about like some specific media outlets like the Atlanta journal and, uh, specifically, um, the T Tulsa Tribune that contributed to these massacres and to the, the decimation of these communities. There were so many, um, you know, uh, papers and so many uh, media outlets that were a part of this as well and made sure, and, you know, I think that the way that it was put, um, that they wanted to give uh, Black people two options. They wanted bankruptcy, or they wanted jail. Those were the only two options besides death right. that they had in mind. Well, um, you took us in a whole different direction. It sounds like okay. you have a case for <laughs> reparations than capitalism. I just wanted to justify the capitalism part, but I mean, we yeah, got okay. MD, if you want to join us, because this is really your topic. Um, okay. Because Nature Mom is definitely making a case for reparations, not so much capitalism not being an evil thing so yeah you went like ah in a oh, okay okay <laughs> I was yeah when, you know when yeah, we talk about these I communities have a, yeah, I, have I have a debate a you know capitalism versus socialism and you went into a whole reparations yeah. spill so yeah. we can kind of well we can jump on the reparations thing because um oh, md shout out to him he's yeah so you're, you're building the case right now for reparations not necessarily I mean, for I, my debate but you know for reparations <laughs> and that's cool well, you know, when it comes to, I think that 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 was my early answer. Um, like, research-wise, scientific, like you know, in in my dive into research, um, mm -hmm. I, I there's a very few people who um, I highly trust um, in the conversation of socialism or capitalism, um, particularly. Um, you know, Du Bois, um, I, I just, I could see through both of these sciences, um, the narrative, the teaching yeah, stance. No, no, I understand the teaching stance. Again, I get yeah. a lot of philosophy, but I want to show real life, like you're showing with the evidence case study with the dead bodies in the prison. Yeah. I yeah. want to show real life case studies against capitalism, against socialism, and socialism has not worked. Capitalism has worked here in the U.S. with descendants of our bloodline, and it's like you get people still rah rahing for socialism, and I'm like, but it's the, the evidence is not there. So that's all I was going with that. You know, well, I mean, that's why I think I that to show you the prominent cities, right? Well, I think that that that's something we. Um, I, I feel like in a sense we're, we're agreeing and not agreeing at the same time because okay. on one hand, um, I don't feel like the sciences have applied to us in, in, in on equal ground, the way that they've applied to other groups of people so are you in the saying, United States. Are you saying that they, are you saying that they didn't practice capitalism, the black people, these black provinces? Um, no, no, no. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that that the capitalism that we were forced to um, uh, like uh, engage in, like it wasn't even you know, a, a thought. We we were just in this system of survival, and with mm -hmm. these pressures um, that were working against our communities from the start. So um, when when I look at like the true sense of what um, like the definition of what capitalism is supposed to be and the true sense, the definition of what socialism is supposed to be. I think that what these communities created was something unprecedented. They created a mixture that was um, a, a sensitive case, particularly um, both 
thrive, like, you know, um, with a focus towards the overall well being of Black people uh, economically and socially. And this is something that's not really a part of the overall conversation about um, socialism and capitalism in, in a general sense, because most so other people- So they were people, the first to use a mix a system, they, but I mean, you talk, well- Yeah, this you, was you a talk, system. Well, first, okay, so- I mean, so, so you, can you, you get know, where I'm going with this? Like, they, the community had to support- itself. It had to be its own social system. It had its own engineers. It had its own doctors and dentists. It had, I mean, at a time where the rest of the country, they weren't even like taking care of their dental care the way black people were taking care of their dental care of the time. You know, we had right. thriving dental offices. You know, uh, when you look at the restaurant, like, yeah, dentistry became like, let's say, you know, flossing is important in the 70s. <laughs> You know, where this was going on at the turn of the century in these black neighborhoods, you know, they they were, you know, the way that it was described, the, the caliber of teachers that were teaching in these schools were better than most universities at the time. So it is. Okay, but what I'm missing here, Nature Mom, is somehow we started from slavery and yeah. then we shot up to where we're already doing bit i'm trying to get to the well, like what, where, where were the steps up. yeah what were the steps yeah. like we know sharecropping they had to have fruits and vegetables to sell and then go from there and build out that so in these history lessons i keep getting slavery and then prominent yeah. cities and i'm like right. okay so I'm, I'm, where, I'm where's the bridge a whole bunch of chapters where's the bridge yeah where's the bridge and, and yeah. i i think yeah, that, that I that's ask, that that's that's a really really um, great question, and um, and I think that that's where the 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 missing history is in in our curriculums. It, it wasn't just this great shoot up. It, there were these people who, when they uh, defected from slavery and they were a part of um, these northern legislative movements to um, deciding what are we going to do? What are we going to do about, you know, the Confederacy? Because, you know, what was the interest of the whites in the north was um, they have too much voting power. And their voting right. power comes from the amount of slaves that they own and the amount of money that is circulating from King Cotton. So, you know, what what can we do to um, to chop off their legs of power? That was their focus. And you had all of these slaves, you know, uh, who defected and they moved north. Um, they were they uh, educated themselves. They were starting to build their own families on the edge of these communities, you know, um, where they were um, they were becoming um, uh, statesmen. They were becoming right. um, prominent figures. They were becoming engineers, dentists, doctors. <laughs> they were going to school for anything they could go to school for because in the north they had these opportunities. So. When you fast forward a little bit, that piece that's missing, the piece that people don't want to say, the same as they don't want to say where, you know, the real support for these massacres came from. These people ended up in these communities together. So many, and I, I, I'm with you on that. How did they create this economic boom when they were supposed to be just like, just, you know, slaves freshly freeing themselves. Well, that's the case. They weren't all slaves freshly freeing themselves. These are people who over a number of years and a, a number of, of generations now have educated themselves. They have given themselves opportunities. They have climbed the ranks of um, political power even in the north and a lot of northerners wouldn't don't want to admit to this as well but there was a time where when you looked at um, these old photos of statesmen a third of them were black senators a third of them were sitting going to washington to these meetings and talking about issues 
of, you know, um, bringing black, you know, vitality to America and getting right. rid of, uh, of this, this atrocity that they called slavery. And so all these conversations were building towards that where America, where everyone, um, you know, who, who is not from our position, don't want to say so blatantly. And, and I will be the first just to call it what it is. Uh, when, when, uh, the North won, um, with the help of these black people who believed in this promise of this new America, when they came back, you know, from fighting this battle and they, all of the, you know, slaves started to defect and, and join these armed forces. When the battle was over, all of these people educated or not free, freshly freed or not, they were all uninvited. And that's the nicest way of saying it. They were all in uninvited to live in, in the neighborhoods and to be a part of this political community any longer, to be a part of conversations. There are people who, um, you know, um, appointed themselves as overthrowers of the government. And you don't hear that conversation too much. It's definitely not in our history books in school. But right. this is the time where you had all these different white supremacy groups taking power and the fuel for their power was their anger that there were so many prominent black people in their communities that were outshining them. They did not. They, they, these people, North or not, agreed more with the ideals of the Southerners than they did with the people, the black people and, you know, the, the friends of the black people that they were living with. There were mayors, uh, senators who were, who, whose lives were threatened, who ran out of town and protected their own hides because of the threat that came down on them. And the people who took over office at that time were not <laughs> on the, the, the side of these black people living in their communities. So these were the precursors of these massacres. So these people were threatened their, I mean, white and black, they were threatened. Their house houses were looted their, um, their savings, their gold, their, um, their finery, their, their, um, yeah, uh, I mean, there was a list of things. So uh, Mom, you're saying that these, terrorists, these terrorist whites and these prominent blacks, are you saying they did or didn't share the same economic system? I'm a little lost. So at, at one point when the, when the North was welcoming, welcoming them, mm -hmm. they, they were trying to integrate somewhat in an economic system. They, you know, the, these, these black people were, were very happy to, um, to, you know, go to their schools to, to be, you know, educated, anything but the South, right? <laughs> they were just so happy to be considered human beings. So they were taking the, the launder, launderer's job. They were, you know, shoe shining. They were doing whatever they can. And at the same time, they were building themselves. And so that's where this small bridge was happening within these mixed communities. What was starting to happen are these, you know, people who will, will then become the father of Jim Crow laws, who will be, who were all already um, growing these white supremacy groups. I don't even remember all the names of it. The, there were so many different sects of white supremacy groups. Ku Klux Klan was only one sect. There were so many right, different, right. I mean, the white, I, they had so many names and these right, groups within these communities were already plotting against them and, and their uh, sympathizers. So, okay. So yeah. obviously you were talking about how the government was in cahoots. So there was no enforcement of no type of governmental socialism in these prominent well, black 
societies, correct? Well, let's be honest, like where, where the government, where they had government supports, because there were governors who were okay. were, were absolutely not allowing, um, you know, uh, discrimination to happen in their towns. So what okay. uh, these these terrorist groups did was they ran these governors, these senators out of town. They threatened them just as equally. They, there were so many coups that happened that are not being discussed and, and talked about in, in our history books. There were so many overthrowing of the government system. There, there was a point, and you know, you guys, like I always say, do your due diligence. Look this up yourself. Look at pictures of senators, you know, from the, you know, uh, from the uh, um, transition of the, 19th century into the 20th century at the beginning you had a whole group of black senators of black statesmen right. and then next right. photo North group Carolina. photo there was not one black face present right. because these people were overthrown the government right. that we were building at one point was overthrown so right. this okay. jim crow government that we we were um like like say we were uh, moved into this government was not the government that was uh fighting with us you know um to to take power over the the confederacy these were people who they themselves they had a big problem with the black people so in their communities thriving creating their own savings their own economy their own banking systems in the community because many of the banks didn't want to deal with them. So they were building their education. They were opening their own savings and loans. And right. all of that was destroyed and threatened in the Northern regions. So when you say, where was the bridge? Those prominent people, those prominent figures, they took all of that education and that knowledge and that infrastructure that they built and the know-how and they just, when, when they were threatened, they moved it to these communities like um, Elaine, like uh, Okincha, like Tulsa, uh, Greenwood, Oklahoma, uh, Seneca Village. They moved their communities because what they were looking for more than anything else was social security. And we're not talking about you know, U.S. government social security system. They were looking for social security because what they could see, what they were learning was that um, their government, their, the, the 14th, the 13th and 14th amendments were not protecting their bodies. There was a rise of uh, lynching every single time the, you know, the, overall government was slumping because they left the gold standard <laughs> and it was their fault. <laughs> and you had these um, black people in the communities that were, you know, doing dealings that they weren't a part of. They didn't want to be a part of it. So they were closing themselves out of economic opportunities. And then they were angry that these groups were thriving and they weren't. Right. So like you said, there was, it, it was this very interesting mix, not textbook, not textbook uh, capitalism, not textbook socialism. It was out of, I think, just pure, you know, natural necessity of, of like enthusiasm to survive versus what was happening before that. And so this, this, this system really doesn't have a name to it. No, no. And on top of it, oh, not we, having we, a name can, to it. Whatever it is, we can put black before, but we don't know black what it is. So black question mark, structure, and economic From structure. this time, and this is what's important, from this time on, we're talking about from, from the 1890s to now. Actually, even earlier, what we even, we'll even say, yeah, the 1880s till now. There has been effort put, put into making sure that that does not happen again. Right, so making right. sure that, um, that we are um, 
fearful to go back there, that we are undereducated to go back there, that we are underfunded to go back there, that we are blindsided by these, you know, um, you know, administrative acts that don't actually help us. Um, that we are, um, and you guys, I'm going to say the hardest thing, you know, because we are from a mixed family. If you're an American, you're from a mixed family, whether you like it or not. Um, so, you know, we have all kinds of rainbows of people in our family. So this is not a, a racial plug, but, you know, to say that when you have, um, there, there is, there is effort made to make sure that um, we will not, um, uh, what's the word, desegregate again. Because desegregating right. was our financial win right. every time. And it was our capitalistic boom, our economic boom. It was our socialistic boom. And the rest of the country usually did not thrive in the same way. Okay, Nature Mom, I got two descendants of people that have came from that lineage that you spoke of. And um, I want to bring to the panel Angel and MD, who are talking about a modern day uh, Mississippi campaign. So I want to bring these brothers in real quick, if you don't mind. Oh, I love Angel. To. MD, what's going on, y'all? Peace. Hi. How you doing, <laughs> sir? Oh. Nice to speak to you. All right. Hi there. <laughs> so, so I will say this. You know, I, I, I'm gonna be quick. I, I don't really have much to offer because you're bringing up some powerful points. I will say this. In terms of you talking about a a a a gap in between the socialism aspect and the capitalistic aspect. I think the most prominent example that we got to look at is Wilmington, North Carolina. So mm -hmm. in, in 1898, when they had the coup there, mm -hmm. it was all based off of the political process and how we were taking shape and form or how we were creating precedents within that certain state. Oh yeah. It, it was all about, the Democrats and the Republicans at that point. You had you had the black people that were, of course, at, at the time of emancipation was staunchly Republican. So it's a misconception that the South wasn't really trying to work with black Americans at all, and that's false. So you had something that was called the Fusionist Party, where, hmm. where you had black people that were mostly populist, meaning that they wanted to work within the capitalistic system. They just wanted to get fair opportunity in doing so. Mm -hmm. And there were white Republicans in the South that were totally 100% with that. So yeah. we, were making move, we were making moves in the political platform in the state of North Carolina to make that happen. What happened was in Wilmington, it wasn't necessarily a race riot. Like you said, it was a coup. It was, it was a, a coup. Democratic coup. <laughs> like you said, we had all types of black people in state seats. Yeah. Yeah. coming out of there and and after that particular situation they were gone because they didn't want us to have a political footprint in that state yes but we were getting there and and in my opinion i think if we were given a chance to do so we would have reparations right now because that's what those populists was going towards that's where that's exactly uh, where they're going right another another example would be tulsa now we look at Tulsa, Oklahoma in that green rural community and think, okay, yeah, these were black people making moves, but they were also fusionists. One way that they were fusionists, you had black Americans that had been emancipated from American chattel slavery, but you also had black Indian freedmen that were in the uh, treaty in uh, 1866 from the Cherokee uh, tribes and the rest of the five uh, civilized tribes. Mm -hmm. That that's that's a whole different standpoint and a whole other political yeah. movement that was going on in that in that particular part of the country. So they were working hand in hand. Now these were yes, yeah. we were all the same people, but politically we were two different sets of people. It's true. One and set of I, people. It's true. Ahead, I would I'm like sorry. to add. Uh, no, I want to add to that. There was also the Black Indians of Louisiana who were part of this discussion as well. So yes, I have to concur. 
this information because yeah. we're always kept separate in this conversation, but they were all black people. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But politically, they were different because mm-hmm. rights had been done, uh, 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 challenged to them by two different sects. You had the Cherokee tribe that were not given uh, reservational citizenship to those black people. That's mm-hmm. the reason they went to Tulsa to collaborate with the black American child of slavery descendants. So politically, we were making moves throughout the country based off of our needs and wants in that particular area. When we look at these different race riots, we, we, we have the mindset to tend to look at them like it was, ba- it was ra- racially motivated. And, you know, like black, white, yeah, you can have that argument. But it was a political issue. Yes. That's, that's yes. the problem that we have to, have to rectify and get into our minds what the political assertions were at that particular time. But that's all I had. Yeah, I, I'm in complete agreement with you as well. Hi, Angel, are you there? Oh, I think there's a connection issue, guys. I, I keep losing Angel. Uh-oh. You on mute, mute Black Tom. Oh, oh, sorry about that. There sorry we go. That. That's, okay. That's, yeah. okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Angel, if you hear us, come back in, man. I want to definitely okay. hear what you got to say. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, um, uh, yeah. MD, did you I, hear earlier? She she really built a case for reparations. She's talking about, man, we all we got to do is excavate and we find some of those that DNA. That's a slam dunk case. I mean, it's a slam dunk case already, but that's just evidence on top of the evidence right there. Yeah, yeah, I've been listening in, and like I said, you know, she she's definitely proving the point. Like, like, I, like I'm rocking with that. But like I said, the only difference that that I would see would be in regards to us moving as a people, but understanding that politically we were different in different parts of the area. Like I said, it as of right now, when you look at how things move in today's age, we can't compare that to like what was going on then so right. i'll go back to when i'll go back to wilmington in wilmington you know that we're in the south you know what i mean there, there are certain yeah. things going on in the south at that particular time so we really yeah. didn't have much of a choice to move that you know the way we did but there were white people that were willing to work with us in commerce and trade to right. build the wealth that we had in that city that's a lot that, you know, people think that we just built the city from the ground up and, you know, it was all black. And we made no, no, no. collaboration. Yeah. yeah, it was a it was a collaboration with those white Republicans that were in the South at that mm-hmm. time. At, to You know, you scratch our back, we'll scratch yours. It was that type of situation. Right. Where where we was able to get prominence in those state seats. Now, say it now. Understand they were district seats. Because, you know, the parts of the parts of the state that we were in, we were moving in those districts. But because we had the collaboration of those Republicans, we could make moves politically. That was the reason why you had these uh, white supremacist groups coming in. Like they could care less what we were doing on our own. But right. once we start to show prominence and, and affecting yeah. the, the things that were going on statewide, that's when right. the issue began. And showing up to Washington, which is what was happening in Wilmington at that time. Correct. You know, you had the representatives showing up. And I'm with you. A lot of people won't say that those were uh, Democrats who went in and created that coup, that coup. But that's exactly who it was. That's and, exactly what happened. Yeah. And it was the, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was the governor of uh, Wilmington who was threatened and thrown out of seat by this democratic party right right yeah so i mean i think that that's like what what can we say you know we we have we've had these opportunities and i think the point that md brought to the table here is that you know there wasn't this you know hardline segregation that was always in our faces the way that we we see it today you know you're this you're dominican you're that you know, people were willing to work together and to, um, you know, educate together uh, for a common good. And, 
Um, but what's happening today is is that, you know, I think the, those conversations are really harder to have as a group because, you know, we're, we're being told, you know, by the uh, Biden-Harris administration that they're going to give advanced, you know, uh, equity and opportunities for Black Americans through these bills. And we're going, yay, they're finally thinking about us. <laughs> And when you go through these bills, these promises, um, they're actually the same shot in a foot uh, that uh, the welfare system, um, same, same shotgun hole that the welfare system brought to the black communities, uh, same shotgun hole that, uh, you know, um, affirmative action brought um, so many different, uh, and I hate to say, to, to like say it so boldly because the civil rights movement is is pivotal. It's an important movement. Uh, I think that what was lost though was um, the black businesses that were thriving because a lot of these communities came back. Those guys, some of them went back to Tulsa after the massacre, after their families were looted, their property was stolen. Yeah. Uh, same with Wilmington, they went back. And they tried to rebuild. Um, but what was different at that time is, uh, you know, you, you had these, um, these inclusion movements, you know. Okay, so you don't need to make your own money anymore. You can go to Woolworth and just sit on their banner outside where it says black only and you can shop there. And we stopped buying um, and uh, creating these uh, businesses that were trying to compete uh, with the, the, you know, stolen goods, the stolen uh, momentum, the, the looted, stolen properties. They took so much. And then wow. they turned around and told us, but you can buy from our stores now. And it really hurt. Uh, black economics from that point on. We were right. never able to get off of our knees um, from that crippling. And, you know, I think like there's been so many movements, you know, let's say Nipsey, you know, he went into South Central Los Angeles trying to build a community. He gets assassinated. And then there you go again, another crippling, you know. Um, when I look at this, uh, the fact sheet, this White House fact sheet, and I'm looking at all of these promises that they're making uh, to, to, you know, create opportunity for black families. You know, I'm looking at the ARP plan and, and you know, the um, all of these different plans that they want to put into black communities, uh, you know, the, these retrofitting from these lead pipes into cleaner piping systems. Um, I don't see one, one promise here that, you know, these, um, these contracts are going to go to black businesses that these, the United States government is promising that not only are we going to clean up the crap that we left in your neighborhoods, but we're going to give these contracts to uh, you, you, black businesses get first dibs. You want to help. That's how you can help. You know, don't raise the Pell Grant money, you know, by four hundred dollars a person and think that you're doing my kids and I any favors when I can take my kids to Europe and they'll get a free higher education. So, you know, uh, I think that these are the things when we're looking at uh, the difference between b black capitalism of that time, there were the opportunities to go get their education. They were able to become, you know, uh, scientists, physicists, mathematicians, um, you know, doctors, lawyers. That's why these communities were able to have all of these prominent people that could so easily grow this beautiful garden. And now they, they keep us crippled, you know, they keep us, uh, you know, um, let's say diving for the pennies that they drop out of their pockets, um, but not really giving us uh, any of those um, reforms that we need to rebuild what was looted. You know, the, we, we need to see some real repair from the piracy. You know, let's call it what it is. These were atrocities. 
and uh, our children. You, you gave our wealth over and over again, even the wealth that we built in between the lines, <laughs> you know, you, 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 you like put us through slavery. Okay. We overcame slavery. Then you told us let's share a crop. Okay. Let's share a crop. Then you cheated us. So we brought in a lawyer. Then you massacred us. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, you, you took our, our, our collected gold. You took our collected goods. You took our, our, um, our wealth that we built even when you were trying to not give us any wealth, you took our properties and we already know, you know, that's the biggest conversation that everyone keeps repeating right now is the generational wealth through land ownership. We know, and you won't even do the work to excavate these lands and to connect descendants with their families, pirated goods so that they can get their wealth back. Uh, I'd like to just like throw out one case that one victory that has happened recently, and you guys have probably heard about it as well. Uh, black family in uh, Manhattan Beach, their their property was yeah. stolen by Bruce's uh, Beach, correct? Bruce, yes, yes. I mean that was that uh, over twenty million dollar property value return to a family. The, right now, what sits on that property is uh, one of the biggest lifeguard stations. They now have to pay 400000 a year in property rent to this family whose property was stolen. That's what I'm talking about. That's how we regain. You, we have to reverse the piracy you know, we have to um, deal with the fact that you you shot us in the knees and every time we try to get up on a crutch, you knock our crutch down. <laughs> we try to, you know, get up on our arms and you chop us at our, our wrist, you know, and, and no one wants to call it what it really was. Uh, last thing I'll say about that point, you know, uh, you, we have all of these uh, museums, you know, that, that uh, are supposed to be sharing, you know, the finest art of all times. You, you have pirated, looted goods that you refuse to return to black nations. That you, you have stolen those goods. They are not your goods. You are not their guardians, their shepherds, their, you know, uh, good, good doers. Return those stolen products return that wealth back to that nation that you pirated and i think that that's when we start to have that real conversation um it's a hard conversation to have you know it to look at your you know the person the people the nation that violated you and say you have violated us i i i recognize that violation it's time for you to do something about it not just talk and throw these you know little piddly um, you know, bills at us, you know, that you're going to, uh, you know, safely open some schools after COVID make our schools safe. You know, young black children should not feel like mom, dad, I don't want to go to school today because I don't want to die. They should not feel that way about their education. So I think that these are some of the things if we want to regain, um, our capitalistic power, you know, we, we got to kind of get back to a place where we, we, we saw our, our power. We saw how we can use our power um, in our own communities first. So just like MD said, it, it was a fusion, but the fusion began because we were able to uh, stand up on our own feet. We were able to embrace and love our own education. And we, we wanted to thrive I think, you know, we, we have to start rejecting the welfare and we have to say, I, I'm better than your welfare. You know, give me back my position as a human being who's worked for this. And, you know, you, you got to pay for it. Every well, criminal like has to pay for reparations. I like the rejecting the welfare part because, you know, um, <laughs> you know, hey, Angel, how you doing, brother? How you All doing, right. Angel? <laughs> um so nature mom angel has a uh mississippi campaign where he talked about the agriculture and you know agriculture has not been the same since the time of Monsanto and these other bio 
all gene altering Franken foods that we have. And I think y'all know me. I'm I'm a whole big on this uh natural foods thing, man. And I think we can really take that back, being that Mississippi has very fertile land. And this is just one of the things, you know. I mean, I know and Angel, you missed the conversation yesterday, you know, me and uh me and MD held it down for yesterday because um they were talking and Yanga and, and, and Brother Trevor, shout out to them. But they said they didn't want to do, you know, sharecropping. I understand that, but it don't have to be just sharecropping. It's just like there's many industries that go into making a pizza. The people that grow the tomatoes, the people that farm the cows, the people that so it's a whole process, but it don't have to be, it could be construction. It could be so many things that require work <laughs> that you <Exactly>. know. <laughs> oh, I mean, let me let me Angel, what's your, well, I mean, you know, I wish you could have been there yesterday, Angel. It just, oh man, it was, I was just like, ah, you know, okay. I, I'm starting to hear people that don't want to work, but uh, you know, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. But I mean, but I do agree with MD. We do need reparations as a boost. But if these grown people get their reparations, and, and this is just yesterday's conversation, and I know. MD would agree with me, man. If them, we these are grown people. You can't stop these grown people. If you give them reparations, let them do what they do. You know what I'm saying? Let them do what they do. But I think there's enough responsible adults that will take that money and re revigorate uh, the economy, revigorate. You know, just I mean, I think they will do great things with it. But that's just me. Angel, let me uh, let me uh, what's your take on this? Well, uh, brother Black Sound, I first want to, uh, you know, give you a shout out. You you starting to fill my head up with stuff like like I'm I'm fantastic and great or something like that. You, you mess with my head, I might mess around and become corrupt. <laughs> All right, the corruption. Yeah. And that's another thing we got to deal with. You know what? We are gonna deal with that too, Angel. We gonna deal with that. Every the corrupt system and all that. You know yeah. what Nature Mom was saying. You had a people. That were working together, they made it happen. Now there was coup, coup d'etats, not necessarily a racial riot, but coup d'etats. So you know, oh man, it's it's. I mean, every system is corrupt, especially if you try to impose a religious system. Man, it's just no. But let me stop ranting, man. I, I you know, <laughs> it's so many other shows we can do off of just some of the stuff that was said yesterday. But we're gonna we're gonna get to that angel. We definitely gonna right. get to that. But yeah, but go ahead. Shout shout to you. Shout to our sister, Nature Mom. It's my first time ever. Miss sister. I had to. I started to hang in the background, but the sister is pretty and everything. I just had to show up. I had to had to greet the, the sister because you know how I feel about the women's. And of course, shout out to our brother MD Twenty. I really don't have a lot to say. I mean, the sister was breaking everything down. And I will admit and confess, you know, I'm, I'm not into into history like that. I know I know basic things. I'm not like MD20. I'm not going to tell you and break it down. Well, in 1875, they did this and blah, blah, blah. I'm not that type of person. I, I, know, I know some of the basics of, of things. And really, that's all that's required. But for those who want to be intellectual scholars... They need um, they need Nature Mom. They need MD20 because they want to be intellectual scholars and go through all that. Uh, why are you running your damn mouth? Just like Black Sun said, what about the work? Are you ready to go to work? Because there ain't nothing going to get done. Our ancestors put in work. Everything they was doing, like what the sister was described, there was no hand-me-down. Everything our people got, they had to work for it. Even if they had nothing. It was, they, they had to work for nothing. It was all about work. There was no EBT card. There was no uh, these different programs, uh, that, all that stuff. And even it was like into the 60s when our people really started taking advantage of some of these social programs or whatever. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, these things would even create it for, it would be created for, for white women and, and, and Caucasian men after the war and stuff like that. But the sister, is going more in depth into what our people was doing at that particular time, which is very important. That's 
the Mississippi campaign, Operation Exodus Mississippi campaign, people keep saying, well, you know, that's Angel's snuffing up idea and it came from. No, what Angel snuffing up seven done was put a name on the activity. That's all I did and bring it to modern times. That's all I done. So when you make mockery of Mississippi campaign, you're really making mockery of our ancestors because the Mississippi campaign is based upon what this sister was saying. It was just a natural instinct to survive and moving forward. That's all it was doing. Now, if you, when you listen to the sister, I did not hear her say, well, the Christians were saying this and, and the other faction was saying that. And when you talk about Tulsa, Oklahoma or Green, whatever, they wouldn't run around talking about their religious beliefs or whatever. It was, it was mostly political. They took their religious beliefs to where it belonged. At church <laughs> on Sunday, that's what they did. They took their religious beliefs on Sunday. Monday through Friday, they, like Black Sun said, they went to work. All that They weren't talking about all that kind of good stuff. They went to work. And then they went to church on Sunday or Saturday, however their faith raised. That's what they done. But the sister was describing, and Black Sun was asking her about capitalism, socialism. The sister brought to our attention, no, nah, it's not exactly the socialism. No, nah, nah. our people, woo, we some bad mama gems. Our people were forming their own way of life, their own way of doing things. They weren't socialists, they was capitalists. What they done, they took a little bit of this, the same way they did in slavery. They took, they took the, the hog, the, the pigtails and the chitlins and all, they took that trash and made a beautiful meal out of it people would pay 15 20 30 dollars for a good soul meal in 2022. they would pay thousand thousand dollars for a quilt that was made of raggedy old throwaway clothes they willing to pay thousand dollars for that now but this is this is our create we lost the creativity see you talking about socialism and capitalism that's somebody else bull doo doo i don't want that I can do my own thing. I can create my own way of life. That's what the Mississippi campaign is about. We're, we're, we're asking the people, not telling nobody nothing. We're asking you, let's do this. Let's change this. Let's make this move. See, that's another thing. People want to tell people what to do. No, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to say, well, if we do this, this is what we get. You don't have to do it. Nobody want to force you to do nothing. Because when you force people to do something, it's not sincere. When you force people to work, they're going to try to get out of work. No, I want to put you to work because even though we put in cotton, you're building a legacy for yourself and your children. You're building not leg not personal generational wealth, national generational wealth, which is more powerful than individual wealth because individual wealth when Black Sun do his individual well, they don't have nothing to do with me. When he passes, ain't none of that cash, none of that land is coming to me. But see, when you get people on board something that's national generational level, whatever that nation does, everybody benefit in some kind of way. Whatever we generate, you get a, you get a piece of paper in your hand, you get the title. You get a certificate. The same thing, see, people talk about Angel Snubbin' up, talk about Look, Garvey was doing the same kind of thing. Garvey was giving the people stocks and titles. You are part of the shipping business. You're part of it. We are in this together. And that way, people, look, there are businesses in China, or Japan rather, the business treat the people so good that they were willing to work for free because the company was taking care of them so well and so good. I do this for free. That's how we have to get to the people, treating the people kind, treating the people good, showing them the benefits. We're doing things our way. It's not about socialism. It's not about capitalism. We're going to take little bits and pieces of things that we got and make it our own, like Michael Jackson did. Michael, Jackson's, Michael Jackson is Michael Jackson. But Michael Jackson, if you look at him, he's a little bit of Fred Astaire. He's a little bit of Elvis Presley. He's a little bit of Jackie Wilson. He's a little bit of all that thing, but he's still his own unique person. 
Michael Jackson. And we know Michael Jackson for who he is. And I say this real quick, and I, I let this go. The sister was talking about the reparations and dealing with these people, telling, asking the people, well, you know, uh, look what you've done and, and help repair us and blah, blah, blah. We're dealing with criminals. You're dealing with criminals. You're not going to get any... A criminal has no integrity or mercy. Any criminal does not pay for the repair of their victim. Not that I know of, unless they forced by a court. I've never heard of a criminal that did something to somebody. You know, I hurt you real bad. Let me go out here and, and make some money and try to repair. I've never heard that from a criminal in his right state of mind, because most criminals don't, they don't offer, you know, they did what they did. And they paying the price by being in jail or the death penalty. They don't offer offer you nothing. So we know after all this time, we're dealing with people, they're not interested in giving us no reparations or doing nothing for us. So Operation Exodus Mississippi campaign is a slick way because if you could take control of a state, the politics of a state, you control the budget. So you control that money. Ah, that's our reparations. That's how we're going to get our reparations because now whether they like it or not, because we got a hold of the money, whether they like it or not. That's how you get your reparation. And reparations means to repair. It's not for you to go out and buy luxury cars or it's to repair the harm that comes for people. So though that money, that is coming to repair the people. And we got to get out of materialism. Yeah, I want to buy a car and the houses and all like that. What do you need all that for? We only have a lifespan of maybe 60, 70 years. You dead. What you need all this material stuff for? You can't take none of it with right. you. You know, we caught up into this materialistic world. Do you know who's most valuable to me than a, than a diamond or gold or anything? Nature mom. Because when I go to the hospital, my car is not going to come <laughs> to the hospital. You know, my, my car, my house is not going to come to the hospital to come see me. I know because I was in the hospital. My car never made one visit. <laughs> I, never got, I never I never got not one phone call from my, from my ex I put a lot of money to that damn thing. So OMC is about the people, all about your happiness. You shouldn't have to work 40 hours a week. That's how families get broken up. Because mama gotta work, daddy gotta you should be able to live decently and still have time with your children, your grand your grandparents before they leave this world and time with your dog Scruffy because he don't have a long time <laughs> lifespan either. So you can enjoy yourself. We want to set up something so you can enjoy life. Working 40 hours a day, that ain't enjoying life for somebody else. That's not even working for yourself hard like that. That's not working. That's, that's not enjoying your life. I'm not here to work yourself to death. Enjoy your life, enjoy your family. Enjoy your children, enjoy your dog Scruffy. That's what it's about creating. And the Bible says, or talks about it too, a new heaven and a new earth. And the former things will pass away. So all these things that we hold on to, we want to grab on, oh, they got to go in order to bring in something new. I'm passing the mic on. I'm passing. Come on, black son. Moderate. So I want to. <laughs> Well, what I want to I want to say real quick is I, okay. I apologize to everybody because I called it black capitalism, but Nature Mind did something. Basically, what you're saying, Nature Mind, we we didn't have a name for it. Yes, no. didn't have a name no. for it. I mean, even when you look at the world of science today, in the world of psychology, sociology, um, in uh, so many areas, um, sciences were designed to work against us in the past. And it's only now that we're being included. I don't know if you guys, uh, why would you, but I, I visit the um, ADA, the, um, oh gosh, the Association, uh, sorry, APA, the Association of uh, Psychological, oh, I got it. <laughs> the American Psychological Association. Sorry, it's getting late. And, um, uh, 
plastered on their main page is an apology to Black Americans for their uh, participation in systemic racism. Um, so I think it's really interesting that these scientific uh, communities are making these efforts to um, make an apology to us. What's very interesting is uh, I think that Angel hit on it perfectly. You know, uh, where apologies need to lie uh, is with our pirateers. You know, our pirateers are not going to apologize. They're going to keep mm -hmm. throwing welfare at us. They're going to keep, um, you know, um, telling us, you know, they're going to fix, you know, waterways and they're going to, you know, um, put more money into our neighborhoods to, you know, um, beautify our neighborhoods for us. We, we don't need that. <laughs> when our neighborhoods are thriving, we will beautify them ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, when our economic system is repaired, because that's what needs to be repaired. What was taken during these massacres at times when our capitalism and our socialism were thriving separate to their capitalistic and socialistic system, um, what was taken from us were our tools to um, to preserve and to grow ourselves. And that's where we are today. In order for us, us to regain our financial health, in order for us to gain our social health, uh, we need our tools back. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop being crippled. And we need to, uh, I'm with Angel, uh, we need to stop crippling ourselves. Uh, Hyper-consumerism is a mental health disorder. Mm. It is self-crippling. Uh, we don't need so much. Actually, we do better without. <laughs> um, and spending our money, you know, uh, you know, Gucci thanks you all. He's very rich. Um, so now... We need to start putting that money into our own communities. Uh, we need to be, you know, I, I miss FUBU. <laughs> you know, I yeah. like FUBU. It was a, I, that was my brand. I love my clothes from FUBU. Uh, unfortunately, when, when they finally wore out, I mean, I, I tell you, I had some FUBU that lasted me over 25 years. Mm. And when it was time for me to go back, I had to look in thrift stores. Unfortunately, all over Europe and places that I've traveled, they don't have thrift stores like they do in U.S. So I miss my FUBU. You know, I, I want to see these companies put back in. You know, th there's so many uh, genres of music, so many genres of fashion that is um, that is appropriated from our culture all over the world. Um, why aren't we the producers? Uh, you know, some of my very favorite, um, yes, capitalists, <laughs> um, gurus out there, uh, that I learn about financial health from the thing that, uh, my favorite, um, uh, I'll give a quick shout out to J Jaspreet Singh because I really like him and, you know, he is a man of, uh, intelligence and, uh, and, he also always calls people out to do their own uh, research, their own due diligence. But the first thing that he always says, you know, as he's teaching, you know, um, is that we, we need to stop being the consumers and we need to start being the producers. Mm -hmm. And oh, I think that that's where we, we have to really reset our minds. Um, just like uh, Angel said, there, there's a great reset that needs to happen psychologically, financially. And it is a part of our whole health system that we've lost. You know, when we're looking for these little, um, you know, uh, handouts, uh, I'm, I'm very dissatisfied as I'm reading, you know, this uh, White House, um, this White House ledger, and I'm going through it line by line and watching them throw peanuts at us like we're, um, huh. you know, animals in a cage still. Um, I don't need your peanuts. You know, get out of my way. Give me my education. Um, and when I go for it, don't don't keep adding these in, these insurmountable costs to this education when you've already you, your family, their grandchildren, you've already eaten off the labor uh, and the wealth that I and my descendants have brought to this country. I just like, you know, the uh, people of the Great Migration, people of, you know, um, all of these communities, these massacred communities, 
uh, like MD said, um, no, they weren't race riots. And, and let's stop covering that up. They were massacres. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, Hitler is, uh, you know, always claimed as a king of massacre, uh, you know, um, so many massacres throughout time. This was also a massacre. Everyone's always talking about the Holocaust. We have lived our Holocaust repeatedly in the Americas. And, um, and it's time that, you know, just don't stand in our way. <laughs> Let us thrive. And, um, and once again, back to what Angel said, we need to stop standing in our own way. We need to look for our personal health. Um, we need to, before we spend $25, $5, before you spend $5, you have to ask yourself, who is going to benefit from that $5 that you spend? Exactly. And, and you need to rethink it if it's not you and your family and your community. Rethink where that $5 is going. And, you I know, agree. Uh, you know, so what else can we say beyond that? <laughs> and I, I also, I'll add, we, we also have to start valuing our position in the market that we currently live in. Yes. Going back, going back to uh, Wilmington, one of their top production in assets there in Wilmington was Taylor. They, uh, uh, the Taylors were the major market in the industry in Wilmington. White people from all over the state were coming to Wilmington to get sharp. You know, back then in, in, in the in the early in, in the late 20th century, early 21st, you know, we stayed with suits and hey, it didn't matter if we were just going outside to go get the mail. We stayed sharp. Mm -hmm. White people from all over the state were coming to Wilmington to get tailored with suits. And, and that, that was our major market. So we have to understand our position in the market. That's where we really lost socioeconomic. We don't have a market anymore. What benefits the rest of the nation? Once we get back into that mindset, we could be awesome. That's where the Mississippi campaign comes into play. And again, like it's a couple of things that me and Talit may disagree on as far as what we do once we uh, uh, set the operation in place. But the ultimate thing is it's going to give black people the market to create the wealth. Mississippi, number one, agriculture. Mm -hmm. We have to get a mindset of, okay, we can have this market set now. It's locked down for us. Now, it, in my opinion, it'll be up to that individual person to want to uh, commit to said movement, but either way, the nation will still uh, uh, benefit from the actions. You know what I mean? So market in terms of capitalism, market is the thing that we have to focus on we have to uh, uh set a foundation in a market in order to, to produce that wealth now i still believe in reparation again like i said me and talit disagree on a couple of things in that aspect but that's going to be the precedent in order for us to build that wealth in said market also when it comes to to reparations i was talking earlier about just the fact that we control the the budget of a state is reparation but also once you come into power because taking control of the state you've actually we've actually taken power and so now when you come to the federal government you know, all all these reparation movements and organizations is it's wonderful and and it's good but if you have a state that goes to the federal government and say, look, yo, you know, hey, you know, what's what's up? We need to, you know, reparations here. That coming from a state is more powerful than our individual separate. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, I, I definitely yeah. agree with that. It, it'll it'll be it'll be the state's uh 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 obligation anyway. You know what I mean? So I agree with that. Shout out to uh NAASD out in California. They they right. showing you that right now mm -hmm. with the reparation task force out there in California. So yeah, it'll it'll ultimately be the state's obligation. The the federal government will have to be the one to recognize it. Mm -hmm. So we yeah, we're in agreement on that. Yeah, so uh I also want to say, and I don't want to be negative because the conversation is very, very going very well, but it's it's a reality. Like I had brought up before, 
our ancestors wasn't tripping on much. Go to work, go to church. Now, if you notice, things start becoming different when we be start becoming pro-black and the pan-African thing. Because all the things and all the successes that we're talking about was not pro-black, was not pro-African. And our ancestors never put that to the forefront. But things started changing for us when we began to get introduced to pro-blackness and pan-Africanism. Matter of fact, we began to focus on Africa more than ourselves. We want to build up Africa and Africa this, Africa that. We suffering here. I don't mind and I have empathy for, for any suffering person on the planet. How can I help Black Sign? How can I give Black Sign $20 and I don't have $20? We have that's nothing to offer Africa. There's nothing. That's why they don't really pay no attention to us. They pay attention to the United States of America and China because they got something to give. Right. We have nothing to give them. They're not interested in you like that. They don't care about your religion of black power because that's what they really, the struggle, they've turned the struggle into a religion. Because right. I know when I was growing up, I didn't hear all this stuff. And right. when I was growing up, I was still in the midst of the original black power when I was growing up. This new modern day version. And when I was growing up, people wasn't throwing their, their personal morality and things into right. the black power movement. You didn't hear that. You heard oh, nothing. We, talk, we talked about agendas, Angel. People got uh -huh. their own agendas. Yeah, they, Go they, ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, but I'm glad you see that's the problem. The black power African, this move, this mindset, they have an agenda. I want to make you a Muslim. I want to make you an Arab. I want to make you some kind of super Christian Hebrew Israelite. They have these <laughs> agendas and they use the struggle, as Minister Farrakhan would say, they use the struggle to hide their dirty religion. They're not really interested in us and our people as a, as a, in, in this struggle. They have another agenda. They want to turn us into an African. See, I don't understand this. We've been in America for 400 years. We never been, we never lived in Africa. We don't know nothing about this stuff. I, they, it would take generations and upon generations for us to even begin to have any interest in no Africa. And then Africa is 52 nations, all kinds of customs, all kinds of people, whatever. The people said, which one I'm going to be? Pick one and go for it. You can't be all Africa, you can't be all of it. There are many, many different Africans, all kinds of spiritual systems. Yeah. For me, Sister uh, sister Nature Mom, I'd rather do my own thing. I like James Brown. Get up and do my own thing. I will borrow a little bit from an African nation, their customer. You know, you can borrow from almost anywhere and make it your own. But I'm not that. I'm happy in my own skin. I'm not going to degrade or look down upon my ancestors. Like everything that you said, sister, in your in your talk, I'm not going to just push that to the side like that ain't nothing. Then you're gonna talk about Egypt and Timbuktu. I, I, I didn't live in no Egypt. I ain't no live in no Timbuktu. I'm going to grasp the struggle from those in Wilmington, uh, Carolina and and, and, and and Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's my people. And that's why I stand. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I don't apologize. I stand with the, the so-called African-American. I stand with soul brothers and sisters. And I prefer to call us soul brothers and sisters. Now, I could come up with something else or, or whatever. But soul brothers and sisters, I was raised on that. That was a that was an identity. That was a label. For as I know, it came from us. That's why I gravitate toward the, toward soul brothers and sisters. And when I was growing up, nobody had a problem with it. You had Soul Train. And I'm very sure all kinds of Christians and Muslims, whoever was going down the Soul Train line, even to this day, they still doing it. And nobody had no problem with that. See, Soul is the actual, is the, is the, is the identity, but Hebrew and whatever you want to call it comes up under that umbrella. That's all it is. Soul is more than just food and dancing and music. No, it's our culture. It's the struggle that you just talked about. It's, it's, it's us. I don't mind being 
who I am, me. If I'm some kind of African, cool, I, I, that's just whatever, but that's not who I am. I'm not going to try to become something I'm not because I look crazy putting on a costume. In order to be an African, well, first of all, we will never be African. Our children can, but the, the process, okay, if I want to be African, I have to take my children to the continent, adopt a tribe, and then as the generations from them begin to, to then they become, they, then they become African. You can't just sit around here and talk about, oh, I'm African. As far as the international law is concerned, you ain't no African. Tell, tell Yanga that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he's never been out of country because you know you're not gonna put you're not gonna put that on your passport. On your passport, those African nations, it's international law, they're gonna view you as an American, sir. Yeah, yeah. That's the reality. And let's be honest, the more I travel, uh, mm -hmm. many of my African friends look at my blue passport and say, mm -hmm. I wish I had that. And I think that that's the power we don't realize that we exactly. have at in the palm of our hands. You know, when I when I leave United States. You know, I'm not just a black woman from South Central LA. You know, I am, uh, I, people are like, oh, you're American. I never have anyone go, oh, you're a black African American. <laughs> <laughs> they never say that. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, you're American. And I can understand you. Mm -hmm. I can't understand British people, but I understand you. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, we really, um, we really don't see the power that we have been endowed uh, from the f from the country we're from, you know, from the lineage, um, our legacy. Yes. It, you know, we don't really realize how powerful that is. And when you look at globally, you know, look at what what is K-pop? K-pop are a bunch of you know Korean kids trying to sing black songs. <laughs> you know, what is uh what's his name? Oh gosh, uh, Justin Bieber, Justin Timberlake. Mm -hmm. Know, white boys trying to sing black style, R and B style. Exactly. You know, I mean, you know, I'm glad. I, and you know, I I can I'm influenced by my culture as well. You know, I think that the thing that we don't see is the power of that influence, how it has permeated the whole world. People they want they want their hair like ours, they want their dress like ours, they want to sing like us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they they want to imitate the power that we have and the only people that i see struggling with that power that identity it comes from within our own community makes sense from a psychological point of view because you know with any trauma with any you know suppression when you're being oppressed and you're being oppressed it's really hard to be resilient and and to hold on to you you know your self-love and your identity um, I did this, you know, two month long uh, research campaign just on black hair in America and the amount of money. I mean, right now we spend over ninety four point eight billion dollars on hair products. Mm. And these are only black Americans. This mm -hmm. is the money that comes from our community. And, you know, uh, just imagine we are ninety six percent of that industry's revenue mm. and yet we do not we've allowed the cosmetic industry the l'oreal's the clariol the uh you know um revlons we've allowed them to come into our communities they saw the the diamonds that we were and they're like oh my gosh we have so much financial potential here and they jumped on it and they've been doing that ever since. It mm -hmm. has been, you know, just like uh, with these uh, massacres, just like uh, MD said, you know, uh, Wilmington of, of 1898, you know, all the communities before that, all the communities after that, where they have gone into our communities, they've gone into our uh, lifestyle, our hair, our uh, our way of speaking mm -hmm. and, and they have taken it for their own financial gain for their own, uh, fashion, fashion gain. You know, I, I saw these two, uh, fashion designers and, uh, it was like this competition. Um, and they, they were eliminated on the, uh, the, um, challenge of urban streetwear. And of course, in my opinion, I thought their outfit was the best. 
Mm -hmm. And at the end, their their walk away speech was, you know, everywhere we go in this fashion world, um, and actually the woman who uh, with the 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 main designer, she designed for FUBU, um, and she said, you know, everywhere we go, you know, um, people take our style from our neighborhoods. You oh. know, we we took what was left over and we made it into fashion gold. And when we present it to the world, then it's street world. When you, when you present it to the world, then it's avant-garde. Mm. And we really need to um, see that for ourselves. We need to see our value, um, our financial value. Okay, yeah, we, we have been thrown for a curve. I, I'll just throw a, a couple of tidbits of information that you guys probably don't know. Uh, you know, I meet black women, African uh, diaspora, all from all over the world. And the thing that they always ask me is, ah, oh, what are you doing with your hair? Like, you know, da, da, da. And um, I always um, share with them this little piece of gold. And I said, do you realize that black women in the United States actually had hair and men? <laughs> had hair that was going down their backs. They were wearing these intricate styles from the inception of slavery all the way up until the 19th century. Somehow in the 19th century, that all disappeared. Our hair got shorter. Our ability to take care of ourselves diminished. Oh. And we've been struggling to get back on par ever since. Why is that? You know, so we've really lost something in our time, um, in, in our history, uh, just like Black Sun was trying to like really pinpoint these very poignant, you know, bridges. How do we get from slavery to, to these, you know, communities that are thriving? How do we make these bridges happen? And we also need to understand how the bridges went the other direction as well. We mm. need to know so that we can repair our own uh, psychological, mental, financial health. I always repeat this as a mantra because this is our whole spectrum of health that we've got to get back to. We have to be where we, we love ourselves, not against a Eurocentric standard. We love ourselves for our own beautiful brown standard mm -hmm. um, that is, in my opinion, the most beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my husband would say it too. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, uh, we need to um, really uh, remember that, you know, we're, we're not at the end of someone else's financial give me stick. We have repeatedly in history, I've rebounded and we've created our own. Um, my, my very favorite joke about, um, uh, I can't remember what, what this, the, the, Ah, can't remember right now. Sorry, guys, tired. But, uh, you know, this black slave is coming up to a, to a stop sign and the white, you know, uh, master says to him, uh, why are you stopping here? And the black, uh, the black slave said, thinks to himself, oh, my gosh, I can't tell him that I'm stopping because I'm at, at, I'm, at, I'm at a stop sign because then he'll know I've been teaching myself how to read. <laughs> so he so he says, uh, I'm stopping at this octagon looking thing. And the, the slave master says, how do you know that's an octagon? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, these are the things that, you know, all joking aside, we, we have to realize like that's where our brilliance has been, always will be. You know, the moment they put, uh, you know, black men and women on those slave boats, they wanted to break down our power because one, they knew we were we were not, um, you know, uh, slaves you guys we were prisoners of war and they knew that the power of the of the places that our ancestors came from they were very proud people they were very prominent people and the first thing they did was they shaved the women of their beauty because our hair meant so many things. It, it meant our health status. It meant our fertility. It meant our social status, where we were coming from. They wanted to strip us from everything they could that would ha allow us to feel a sense of pride. And the thing that we keep somehow, you know, coping and regenerating within ourselves is that sense of pride. And we keep building on that pride when, when you know, uh, slavery was, let's say, announced that it was being abolished. 
first thing we did, we ran off, we educated ourselves. We grew our own, we did our own. So I think that that's just the thing we, we really have to look at as we move forward and we're reaching out to, uh, like Angel said, we're not looking at uh, Africa and, and, you know, we're not worshiping the motherland. We're worshiping the mother within mm -hmm. ourselves. We're worshiping where we, where we are right now. And, and we are worshiping the fact that we are intelligent, creative, innovative, resilient mm -hmm. human beings. And we've shown a strength that not a lot of people have shown on this planet repeatedly after exactly. repeatedly, you know, so it, it's time that we, we dust ourselves off once again. You know, we look at these bills, we read through them line by line. We, we write Biden the letters and we say to him, look, you know what? I, I don't need you to um, fix some pipes in my neighborhood and, and upheaval the streets that I have to commute back and forth to work as I'm building my wealth and I'm teaching my children to build their world. I don't need you destroying my streets, you know, and giving those contracts to somebody else. I need those contracts in my neighborhood. I need them to go to, you know, my constituents. Um, we need uh, our schools. We don't want you doling out the dollars for us. I want that money in our hands. We are going to allocate where those funds need to be grown. You know, I mean, let's be honest. We need to be... Uh, we need to be growing the food that our kids in, in the school systems are eating, not letting them, you know, have these exacerbated budgets, feeding them, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches yeah. that are 90 percent sugar to our children. And then and then when our kids are off the chain and can't learn, then they want to give them antidepressants and label them, you know, ADD, ADHD and, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. oppositional disorder. And, you know, no, we need them to have a decent you know, nutrition, we need their cells to develop properly. And your nutrition programs are not working for our, our cellular development. So let, let us have our money back. <laughs> we will, we will take care of that ourselves. We'll go our own gardens. We will, you know, we will go into coalition with, you know, uh, Mississippi campaign. We will put small gardens in our own schools, That's right. you know, we will do these things because we are capable and we don't need you to babysit us because you babysit us, you have babysat us and you abused us and we reject your abuse. Exactly. So I'm, I think that's it for tonight. <laughs> Where you at black son? <laughs> I'm right here. Y'all right here, right here. That check on my tire, man. Oh, Hey, so hey, we're gonna wrap it up, y'all. Hey, we got yeah. hey, um, we got to do another show because I I got a lot of topics from what MD, Nature Mom, and Angel was saying, and it, it, it could veer off into the whole another conversation because MD, you gotta come back because uh Nature Mom is building up a case for that reparations. So we got we gotta we gotta touch on that too. Oh and yeah, most definitely, most definitely. Yeah, yeah, that that that's that's something that we gotta definitely we gotta we gotta discuss. Yeah, 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 we can do that. And like I said, you know, it all ties back into to Operation X in Mississippi, mm -hmm. and and we can discuss right. that further. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. And Angel, um, I don't know if you watched the show yesterday, but I want you to go over that because uh, a lot of pushback, but but like Nature Mom, but I'm glad we had a show with Nature Mom today because I didn't know what to call it. I just know that we live here in America, like MD said, we're Americans, and we just I want to say I think we were kind of repeating something that we saw, and we just became good at it, mm -hmm. and we came up with the Tosas, we came up with the um, Rosewoods and all that, and so whatever that is, I don't, I don't, and I definitely know it wasn't socialism because it wasn't, for, you know. I don't know what whatever it was. Um, I mean, yeah, we we I think uh, Operation Exodus Mississippi is in the inheritance of that. So yes, um, it could be done again. I just wanted to prove that Exodus Mississippi, like you said, uh, Angel, has been done. Yes, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I mean, we can go through all the prominent black cities. It's it's been done. It's been done. So I don't understand this pushback against it. I don't. I don't get it. But but I did say it was going to be pushed. Work. Huh? 
<laughs> work, work. <laughs> People don't want to work. <laughs> yeah, that's all it is. Right, and, and, right. And yeah, we have to understand again. I, I keep going back to the same word. You know, it. Yes, we worked, but we had a market. That that right. that yes. was the gap between emancipation Congress. and the exactly. wealth. We had a market, despite yes. if you didn't like us or not. We had a market. That's the thing that people don't understand. When you talk about comp, uh, capitalism, yes, we mimic what we saw, but we weren't stupid either. We understood in order to build wealth in our own community, we have to have a market in order to produce the goods for said community. You know what I mean? So that's the gap. So again, we can do another show on that. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we can go into things. And because I, I think that's the thing that Yang and them didn't understand. Like right, they right. think they think that everything can be done within the community, within the community, everything can circulate and we can produce stuff for our own. But like I said, it's it's the it, it, it's yeah, me MD, giving you a yeah. dollar and circling around. We have to put something out to bring the money in through the pipeline. Right, but 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 MD, what, what we're talking about here today, I mean what Yango was saying to me, and that's why I was getting pushed back, was he was, you know, socialism is is the government taxing you as a working man, making you participate in communalism. It has to be organic. If it's forced, it's going to be pushed back. So I, I, I don't, I'm not down with no government forcing me to, you know, I mean, socialism as we know it, it's the working people being taxed to take care of people who are not working. That's the way I look at it, brother. But, you know, we could, we could and, yeah, add and, to that, go if ahead. I may. Uh, so I, I just realized what you guys are talking about, because I'm sorry I missed the show. Uh, but um, one thing that I would like to add, some, some economic facts here, is that, um, you know, governments had a very limited uh, participation in our economic system until they destroyed the gold standard. Before the gold standard was destroyed, um, they they did not uh, tax us in the same way that they do now. So, you know, they weren't involved in, let's say, welfare systems because right. being on the gold standard, it, it forced everyone to balance out. So, you know, you you were able to create that commerce within your community um, without this uh, inflation system and this debt system that basically this, this fiat, you know, fake money system <laughs> that creates these very huge um, inflationary waves of, um, of, of economic imbalance. So, you know, we didn't have this struggle before the gold standard was, was destroyed. Um, so I think that, you know, if, if I understand what you're saying now, MD, is, is absolutely correct. When, when, we cr- when we somehow operate in a financial system where we are the producers, you know, and let's say we're, we are only consuming what we need to produce more and to survive and, you know, and we can live in that healthy balance of I've got what I need and, you know, okay, maybe a little extras here and there, but I don't have to, um, I don't have to live this, this psychological backlash that's happening now where people are, you know, they're, they're making enough from paycheck to paycheck (laughs) and then they're like going out and spending what they make to, to make themselves feel better because their life is not what they want it to be. And that's the bottom line. They're trying to reward themselves in a way that has been brainwashed into their system uh, to, to make them believe that they're getting something out of the work that they're doing. And I think that like, when we go back to these communities when we, that, that uh, you know, like Angel said, they absolutely had nothing when they started off. So they built from nothing. Mm -hmm. They lived off of what they needed and the rest was commerce. The rest was, was production that brought back in something into the community. And when we start to like function there, then every shoe shiner has a purpose. Every, you know, movie theater, you know, ticket puller, it's their community too. So they, they feel a sense of pride. This is their movie theater. You know, because the, because the economics have been brought into that community. Yes. 
So, you know, when you're spending your, your you know, uh, money, I haven't been to the movies in a while, so I don't even know how much, but when you're spending your money on going to a movie theater and you know that that movie theater is, you know, a community member and they're going to spend their money back on other things within your community, you're proud to work at that, you know, that movie theater. It's your movie theater. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we're missing in, in and kind of back to what Angel was saying um, hi, Yanga. <laughs> uh, back to what Angel was saying, um, you know, about let, let's not try to reach our arm all the way to Africa. Let's try to reach our arm right to our own communities and build them where we are. Let's get the pride going being rebuilt within ourselves and within, within our communities. And then when we are in a position to be, you know, feel, you know, like a generous charity, then we can be charity. But yeah. right now we need to build ourselves um, because we still have a lot of wounds that need to be um, addressed and healed. And then we have to like Indy saying, find our own commerce so that we are the producers not the consumers right right all right y'all well, shoot um man this is a great show um angel when is your next live i'm going live at 2 30 central oh central well, shoot. we need to we need to wrap it up so we can go to your show <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and I would hope that the sister too would, if she have time, come by, stop by, say a few words. And it's a general discussion, you know, it's random topics. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, you'll get uh, the link to me. It's I probably have some more time. 